I'd like to invite you, if you will, to uh, join me in a prayer before the message today. Uh, if you feel comfortable extending your hands as a sign of receptivity to the Word of God, I would encourage you to do that. Father, here we are, um, your children, um, gathering all in our homes and in the church here, a few of us, and all over the country. We pray, Lord, that as we gather and as we listen, that uh, your word would become real to us. Father, I pray that uh, any words that are not from you would be quickly forgotten and those words that are from you would be sealed in our souls, in our hearts, in our minds, in our hearing. Thank you, Father, for your word. And I pray that your word by your spirit would come over this place and every home and uh, that we would hear and receive what you have for us today. And I pray those things in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. So let's review what uh, we've discovered about it. Uh, we introduced the subject two weeks ago and discovered that an it person or an it church begins and in some ways ends with the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit within you. People that have it and churches that exhibit it are ones who have surrendered their lives to the Spirit of the living God. I'll tell you, God does not want a casual relationship with any of us. He does not want a tip of the hat. He doesn't want a kiss on the cheek. He wants an intimate, personal relationship with each and every one of you. That's his highest priority is to have that kind of intimacy with his creation. And then we talked about unction, which is a deep conviction in your soul that is the result, not of effort, but it's the result of the soul's desire, according to Calvin Miller. It is being in step and being overwhelmed with the spirit of the living God. And then last week, we looked at the it trait, a passion for his presence. It is recognizing the importance of being with Jesus. So there's a, a wonderful story in uh, Luke chapter 10. And I didn't put this on the screen today, so um, I'll just read a, one verse from Luke 10. But it's about Jesus traveling, and he visited with his friends, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And this story is about Mary and Martha. And so Jesus is in there and they're chatting and Mary just comes and plops down right at Jesus' feet and just wants to absorb every word he says, everything he does. And Martha's scurrying about uh, making lunch and you know, doing whatever she does. And, and after a while, Martha gets kind of mad and says, hey, Mary, tell Mary to come help me, Jesus. And Jesus said, whoa, whoa wait a minute. And, and let me read you this passage because it's, it's really good from uh, Luke chapter 11. Uh, this is verse 41 of chapter 10. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, he wasn't mad at her, my dear Martha, you were worried and upset about all of these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. What Jesus was saying was, Martha, what you're doing is not unimportant. It's very important and you're serving and that's wonderful. But Mary has found the one thing the one thing, and that one thing is being in the presence of Jesus. And we discovered last week that um, the disciples uh, experienced that. Um, so when Peter and John were taken before the council because they had been preaching the good news, they were thrown into jail. The next day they came out, and once again the council said, hey, listen, you guys, you got to stop doing this. And then <laughs> Peter just had this profound message, and at the end, the, the council said, we don't know what's going on, but we do know this. These extraordinary men that are just really ordinary men have done extraordinary things. And he said, and we've recognized the fact that you have been with Jesus. Now, Jesus had been dead for, what, almost 60 days. But instead, uh, they recognized that somehow this power that they had came from hanging around Jesus for three 
years. And in addition to that, what they didn't realize is that the presence of Jesus by the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit in their lives, they were still very present with him. And so Peter, uh, as you know, he was always rambunctious and always wanting to do the right thing. And so what we find was that Peter was very powerful and into everything, drew his sword, cut off the ear, uh, the ear of Malchus, the high priest's servant, and he was always ready to do whatever. But as soon as he was a distance away from Jesus, he was out in the outer courtyard and in Caiaphas's palace, uh, they were in there talking to Jesus. And as soon as he had this distance from Jesus, he lost that zeal and that passion for him. So what's the difference? Simply one word, proximity. How close are you to Jesus? How near are you? are you to his heart? And so that's what we discovered last week, that uh, Jesus uh, is what you are hungry for. Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Jesus said, what you were hungry for, what you were thirsty for, I mean, victory, life, abundance, freedom, resurrection. Jesus said, I'm it. I am all of those things. I am am the bread of life. You're hungry? I'm the bread of life. You're worried about uh, what's going to happen to you in eternity? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. You wonder about what's going on right now? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Jesus said, if you want this kind of power, if you want to be it, be in my presence. Be near to me. Proximity. He is your bread. He is your drink. Now today, uh, we're looking at another it quality, an it trait, and that is sincere integrity. Sincere integrity. Webster's definition of integrity. An unimpaired condition. Soundness. The quality or state of being complete or undivided. Now the word integrity in the Bible has as its root word integer, okay? And that's mathematicians, that's a whole number, right? So we want to be integrated. We want to be whole. We want to be one. So let me give you a couple of verses that talk about integrity, and you'll find those in the book of Proverbs. Now, the book of Proverbs was ancient literature uh, written much of it by Solomon, who was probably the wisest man in the world, and at the time, he was certainly the richest man in the world. And uh, he wrote these Proverbs through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He wrote these Proverbs, and these Proverbs are good for everybody. Not just Christ followers, not just people that call themselves Christians, but these are good for everybody because these are saying, hey, here's a better way to live your life. Here's a way where your life will turn out better if you do it this way. So Proverbs 10, 9, this is what Solomon says. The man of integrity walks securely. But he who takes crooked paths will be found out. So there's this straight path. So if, that's what, if you want integrity, you walk this straight path. But a man who walks this crooked path, he'll be found out. And then in Proverbs 11, verse 3. The integrity of the upright guides them. But the unfaithful are destroyed by their, here's a great word, duplicity. Duplicity. So integrity is walking straight and standing tall. Now in Scripture, there are two nuances to the word integrity. Uh, the first nuance is just simply the word straightness, as opposed to crooked, meandering, kind of wandering around like Moses did in the wilderness for 40 years, right? Just kind of wandering around. No, it's, it's taking that straight path that God provides for us. So uh, before COVID... Once in a while, especially in the summer, Sherry would say, honey, let's go to the mall and walk, right? We'd do that, right? And so I begrudgingly would go because I knew what that meant. To me, going to the mall and walking means that you're just walking, you know, as quickly as you can and you're just, you're straight and you're going right. And so we're walking and I'm chatting away and everything's good. And then I look over and Sherry's gone. I mean, she's gone. I look at, she's 12 stores behind me. Okay, way, way back there. So she was distracted. Now, she doesn't buy much there. It's too expensive, right? But she window shops and like that. I wanted this straight path. But so many times 
we get distracted and we start moving to another path, moving another direction. Integrity is walking straight, recognizing this is the way that God has called for me and to walk straight in that way. Now, the other nuance to the word integrity is single-mindedness. Single-mindedness. In other words, not being duplicitous. No duplicity in your life. Saying one thing and doing another is a person that is duplicitous. Wearing a mask. Now, we wear these masks for safety, right? And, uh, you know, we all have them and we all wear them just about everywhere except at home. And, and uh, we wear those. But, but what the writer of um, the Proverbs here is saying something different than just wearing it for protection. Wearing a mask to cover up who you really are. Now, the word comes from Greek theater in the Greek language. And the word is upokritai. Upokritai, that's the Greek word. Do you, you hear what's in that word? Anybody? Anybody? Hypocrite. Thank you, Sherry. We've got five people in the congregation today. And uh, so, upokritai is the Greek word for mask. It's a hypocrite. It's someone who appears differently than they really are. Now, that's what an actor does in the Greek theater. That's what an actor does, right? On uh, the movies we watch, they wear a mask. A person of integrity drops the mask, the pretense. The person of integrity walks straight and is single-minded, much like a Martha, or much like Mary as she was at the feet of Jesus. Now, the most single-minded, focused person who has ever visited this earth was Jesus Christ himself. Now, a lot of people argue about what Jesus said, but here's a very simple, basic theological premise that I think you'll agree with. If you want to know what Jesus meant by what Jesus said, look at what Jesus did. If you want to know what Jesus meant by what Jesus said, look at what Jesus did. That is a person of integrity. In other words, what they say and what they do are integrated. What they say, their heart and their hands are exactly the same. They live a life not of duplicity, but a life of integrity. So Jesus was preaching on the Sermon on the Mount in uh, Matthew 5 through 7, right? And there um, he walked and spoke and acted and believed and behaved as one. Integrated. Integrity. So Jesus was speaking about uh, this whole idea, this concept of kingdom living when he was uh, doing the Sermon on the Mount. And this kingdom living had the idea that um, the way that we act and behave is very much connected to our heart. In other words, our heart and our hands are in unison. So Jesus gave some examples. He said, he said now he, he said, it is written, okay, talking about the Torah, right, the Old Testament, uh, the Pentateuch in this case, uh, it is written, talking about the Ten Commandments, that uh, man should not commit murder, okay? So that's just, a, that's just, that's good for all of us, right? That's a good plan, you know, for all of us. Don't commit murder. Okay, Jesus said, but I say to you, in other words, okay, that's with your hands, okay? What you do with your hands, don't murder somebody, don't strangle somebody, don't kill somebody, don't do that. That's a bad idea, right? But he says, I say to you something even further, right? If you look at a man or a woman and you hate them, it's like you've already committed murder in your heart. So you see what Jesus is doing here? He is calling all of us to drop the mask, drop the duplicity, and be a person of integrity. Make sure that what you say and what you believe are the same thing. He went on and he talked about another, another one of the big ten, right? The Ten Commandments. He said, thou shalt not commit adultery. We'd all agree that's a great idea. Now, a lot of people fail in that area, but everybody would say on the surface, yes, good idea, don't commit adultery. So that's, you know, that's out here. That's the physical act, okay? But Jesus said, but I say to you, that's what the Old Testament said, but I say to you, anyone who looks upon a woman with lust has already committed adultery in his heart. You see what Jesus is doing here? 
he's letting us know that uh, we cannot be divided. We have to have an undivided heart. Our hands have to match our heart. The, way, the things that we do have to match the things that we believe. And so he goes on in chapter 6 of um, Matthew, and uh, we read these words. Now, you'll see these on the screen, but I want to read just the first, uh, let's say, five verses of Matthew chapter 6. And he's explaining this idea of not being duplicitous, of having a life of integrity. Listen to these words. Watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others. For you will lose your reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and the streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on the street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. Notice the frequency of the words in the NIV. It says, be careful not to be seen by others. This is a matter of integrity. Now, it refers to the Pharisees. The Pharisees would come into the temple. They would have these amazingly beautiful, ornate robes on. Very expensive. Remember, some of the uh, Jewish religious leaders were some of the most wealthy people in all of the Roman Empire. And remember, the Jews were enslaved to the Romans, but these people have risen to a place of being very, very wealthy. They have these beautiful, ornate robes, phylacteries hanging from their wrists, from their forehead, and they would come to the temple, they would raise their arms, and they would pray out loud to God, and everybody would go, oh, they are so spiritual. They are so religious. They are so connected to God. When it came time for the offering, they would take these big bags of coin, coins. And they had these little coffers that they would put their coins in. The widow's might, when she did it, it was a little wooden coin, couldn't even hear it. When they put, one at a time, they would almost slam their coins in there. Bing, bing. And everybody would say, wow, look how generous these Pharisees are. Paul said, excuse me, uh, uh, Jesus said, these are whitewashed sepulchers. These people look good on the outside, but on the inside, they are dead. That is duplicity. That is double-mindedness. That is not being a person of integrity. Their hearts are far from God. They say all the right things. They do all the right things, but their hearts are far from God. See, for them, it's an image management game. In other words, perception and the ability to enhance or advance your agenda or your cause is what really mattered to people in that day that had no integrity. But the same is true of us today. Jesus says there's only one agenda. That is the law of Christ that's never changed. There's only one agenda and one cause, and it's mine. He said it in John 13, 36. He said it in dozens of other places. John, Peter, Paul, all of them said the same thing. It's, this is Christ's law. Christ's law is to love each other in the same way that God has loved you. With that sacrificial, all-encompassing, I don't want a tip of the hat or a kiss on the cheek kind of love. I want the intimacy. I want that great love with you. We are to love each other the way that God has loved us. That's the agenda. That's what we're called to do. That's to keep from being duplicitous. We have to keep that as our straight and narrow standing tall and walking straight. Everything else is duplicitous, image management. So what is Jesus saying to the Pharisees and to the disciples and to you and to me? It's this, who are you when no one else is looking? Now recently, since last, um, what I just, just maybe three days ago, I forget how many days ago it was when uh, Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin, was shot in the back multiple times while he was trying to get into a car, and his three children were in the car. And this is a very ugly scene if you haven't seen the, uh, uh, the videotape. But again, once again, um, things that people used to do and not get caught 
are now seen everywhere, right? And what God says is this, even if no one sees you, even if no one sees what you're doing, God says, I see you. I know what you're doing. That's why we have to be people of integrity. People of integrity. So I was uh, listening to all of the, because of what happened to uh, Jacob Blake, there's kind of a renewed um, protests and going on, uh, especially among the black community, and uh, all understandable. Uh, please don't riot, though. I mean, let's protest without rioting. And so there's this sense that, oh, man, this isn't over. I mean, we just were kind of calming down from what happened six weeks ago and, and other incidences. And um, so on sports radio, they're talking about this because they canceled some basketball games, canceled some baseball games, talking about even maybe canceling a football game or two. And uh, so all of these things are going on on talk radio. And then at the end of the show yesterday, Ron Wolfley, uh, who talks, who's the, the, the host on uh, Monday through Friday from 6 a.m. to 10 10 a.m. When they close the, their show at 10 o'clock, they always leave a word with everybody. And I've never heard this on public radio before. This is what Ron Wolfley said. He said, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Here's my word to you. Love each other. Boom. Turn the radio off, right? There's something powerful about a non kind of Christian format like the radio declaring Christ's law declaring what we are supposed to be focused on completely, what we are supposed to be doing, what we're supposed to have this laser beam focus on, this straight, narrow path of loving God and loving people and doing that the way so that people ask why and they can come to know Jesus and experience his love and his grace. We are called to be that straight and narrow road, not meandering off, not being duplicitous, not having, being double-minded. Who are you? when no one is looking. Integrity is consistency on the inside and the outside. It's like a, a pastor's wife, uh, one that you don't know, um, a pastor's wife was frustrated at her husband because he, um, well, at home he was just kind of moody and a little bit out of sorts. And so one day she got frustrated with him and this pastor's wife said, listen, uh, honey, I've got a great idea. This week, why don't you try being grumpy at church and pleasant at home, okay? <laughs> Duplicity versus integrity. For some, wearing a mask can be a way of life, right? So I don't know if you used to watch or read the Dear Abby in the paper. I used to read that religiously because it was hilarious. And here was one that was called Trouble in Georgia. And it was a woman writing in about her daughter, her daughter who was in the army. And the woman wrote in and said, listen, my daughter is an, the, an army sergeant at Fort Stewart, Georgia. Uh, they've just gone through six weeks of intense training uh, in survival conditions and primitive conditions. And at the end of that six weeks, my daughter frantically uh, called me. And this is what she said to me over sh the phone. She said, mom, I met someone during training I'd like to know better. But we're not allowed to wear makeup, so he has no idea what I really look like. Isn't that the way we are? We want people to see us as we think we should be seen. But instead, we put on a mask. That's what Jesus was teaching. These educated, religious Pharisees were wearing masks, and that was their way of life. That's how they gave their offerings. That's how they would pray. That's how they would fast. When inside their lives was filled with pride and selfishness. Jesus served notice on the, mount, on the mount that day that you would want, if you want to be in the kingdom of God, if you want to be invited to his party, no masks. And then Jesus basically gives two tests, what I would call two integrity tests. The first one is this, the audience test. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness to be seen by them. Who's them? Anybody, right? Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness to be seen by them. Your audience, if your audience is others, your reward, Jesus said, is here on earth. But if your audience is God, if you are playing to an audience of one, then your reward will be in heaven. Back in 2007, um, our church, Hope Covenant Church, we planted a new church in Gilbert, Arizona. It was called The Bridge. 
In fact, the bridge is the church I just finished being their transition pastor before I started being your transition pastor. So I was there the last year. Their, first, uh, their, pa- their only pastor, uh, Kent Bertrand, was there from 2007 uh, to 2018 and uh, then went on to become a marriage and family counselor. But I remember when we were planting that church, um, Kent, um, uh, Kent and his family were in our church for six months. We helped them plant. They gathered people, etc. Started, they planted the church. And I remember when they first planted, uh, Kent sent out a letter asking for help financially, right? And for help people. We need, we need behinds in the seats and we need money in the offering plate. You know, he didn't say it that crassly, but that's what he was saying. And we all know that, right? That's, we still do that as church. And so, uh, and so he, he sent out this and he got some people that gave money. I know, remember Sherry and I contributed to the bridge and our church did. In fact, we supplied half of their uh, budget for the first year along with half from the denomination. And, uh, and so we were very invested in this and, and Kit told me, he said, he said, about a week into this, I got uh, a, a check in the mail from someone for $1,000. And it was such a blessing and it was so wonderful. And uh, he said, I put it with the rest and we're you know, starting to gather enough money to get this thing going. And, and he was really blessed and really, and then about one day later, after he got that check in the mail, he got a phone call. And the phone call went something like this. Uh, Kent, uh, did you get something from me in the mail? He said, oh yes, I did. And I, and I was planning on calling you and thanking you. He said, well, I didn't hear anything from you. And Kent in his spirit went, uh-oh. This has got strings attached to it. Now, in my, my history of my being in a, a pastor, there have been a lot of times when people have given money and they've, they've given a check like this, but there's a string attached to it, right? No, we are to give. We are to serve. We are to honor others without duplicity, without needing something back, without needing our back scratched. We need to give our very best. Or, or like... Um, at a family gathering for like Thanksgiving. And nobody wants to ask Uncle Bert to pray, but you know, he always prays, so he does. And Uncle Bert has an agenda. His agenda is, uh, okay, I am going to make sure that in this family gathering that if you're not saved, you're gonna get saved during my prayer. And I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the plan of salvation, the doctrine of atonement, and we're gonna do all this in my prayer, and, uh, and it'll just go on and on, and we're going to do it until just as I am, please. And it, we're going to, and the turkey's getting cold, the mashed potatoes getting cold, and then you have to ask yourself, what is Uncle Bert's agenda? Is he praying to God, or is he praying to the audience? Well, you know the answer to that. You see, last week in my Wednesday talk, I talked to you about the importance of serving, of putting the servant's apron on. That's what Jesus is saying here. Don't worry about what, whether somebody else notices that you did a good deed. Don't worry about if you get credit for doing something. If you do it with a right heart, God says, I will be your reward when you get to heaven. Where's your heart in this? Praise of man or the love of God? Is it for the audience of others or for the audience of one? Well, then the second test, the second integrity test, is what I would call the secrecy test. Uh, What would I do if no one saw me? 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Paul writes these words. When the Lord comes, he will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. Someone with integrity, their heart matches their actions even if no one else sees. So here's your assignment for the next week. Your assignment is to do at least one secret act of love. Okay, it could be to a family member, a church member, a neighbor, an enemy, but you do a secret act of love. You can figure that out, what that would look like. Now, if next week I come back and I say, okay, I'd like to hear some examples of some secret acts of love that you did, and you tell me you failed the test, okay? Don't tell anybody. This is a secret act of love. We need to constantly remind ourselves that we are doing this, listen, for an audience of one. Not for an audience, but an audience of one.
So how can we find this elusive thing called sincere integrities? The Pharisees were whitewashed tombs, Jesus said. On the outside, they were clean. On the inside, they were dead and rotting. But the Bible is clear about us, about you and me. Our hearts are deceitful above all things. We recognize that each and every one of us have an enormous capacity to sin. I mean, we know that many times what's in here doesn't match what we say or what we do. So the first thing we have to remember to really be a person of integrity is to be absolutely honest before God. Absolutely transparent before God. Listen to Hebrews 10, 22. Let us draw near to God. How? With a sincere heart. Undivided. Undivided heart. In full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. And having our bodies washed and purified. That word purified comes from the Greek word that we use for the word cathartic or catheter. It's to cleanse out impurities. A catharsis is an emotional cleansing of hostile attitudes. We are to be purified by washing, cleansing our soul of anything that's displeasing to God. In Ezekiel 36, the Lord says, I want to put a new heart and a new spirit within you. God, I, I, I need you. We need that face-to-face -face honesty, that transparency. In AA circles, we talk about a fearless moral inventory, coming before God completely as we are, holding nothing back. We have some really good friends. We went out to breakfast with them a couple of weeks ago uh, that are in a small group at their church. And the, both of these people are... Um, a long time uh, uh, been out of the alcohol drug culture, but they've been very involved in um, AA. Uh, they've been sober for a long time. Wonderful Christ followers. And they said they go to their small group and then they just kind of bear their souls like they do at an AA meeting. You know, like, man, I really struggled with this week. And I, I'm, man, I, I just need your help. I, I need your prayers. Uh, I'm, I'm really weak in this area and I, I need God to help me and to strengthen me. And, and they said that their small group was very helpful. Was, oh, that's, oh, we're so, oh, God, we'll pray for you and even lay hands on them. But, but no one else in the group would share what's going on with them. No one else would dare be transparent. No one else would say, I need help. No one else would say, I, I, I just don't know if I believe that anymore. There was this lack of transparency and honesty. Friends, this is where we have to get with God. This is where we have to get individually. And this is where we have to be as a church. We have to be open and honest before God and before each other. The church should be the safest place in the world. And one of the things that I dear, deeply regret is know, knowing a lot about history and the history of the church is for so many hundreds of years, that probably for 1,300 years, the church has been simply hiding from the world and trying to hide from God. Oh yeah, we'll say temple of the Lord, like in Jeremiah's day, we'll say praise the Lord, we'll say God bless America, we'll say all those things, but there's something deeply hurting inside of me. We need to be transparent before the Lord. I, I, I get tired of hearing people say to me, I, I, you know, I don't go to church anymore uh, because the church is filled with hypocrites. And I always say to them, there's always room for one more. You are a hypocrite. Every human being on this planet is upocritai. Everybody wears this mask some of the time. We need to drop those masks. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to give us courage because, listen, secrecy leads to death. Secrecy leads to death. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to give us courage. And listen, we don't want there to be any judgment here at Grace Community Church. We want you to be honest and open. When we gather together in a few weeks, when we start meeting together and seeing each other face to face, we need to be honest with each other. We need to be open. We need to be transparent. There's a wonderful book by John Fisher. It's entitled 12 Steps for the Recovering Pharisee. Now, the reason 
I love this book is because I confess I am a recovering Pharisee. Listen to the words that he writes and see if it resonates with you. As I have grown to understand the gospel, and as I learn more of God's grace, I've also become conscious of a corresponding struggle with pride and self-righteousness. Like anyone, I want to be well thought of. I am also often conscious, as I am even now at this very moment, and I would speak for myself, of picking my words carefully, like walking through a minefield of impressions, so as to appear honest while stopping short of the naked truth that might implicate me more than I am willing to show. It is a problem that the Pharisees of Jesus' day sought to overcome by concealing themselves behind white, wash, religious veneer. The church should be the most honest place on the earth. But instead, I see so many masks being worn at church. My name is Dwayne, and I am a Pharisee. Maybe some of you would say the same thing. I don't want to be a Pharisee. Many moments of my life, I'm not a Pharisee, but I confess to you, it is so hard to be guarded by what I say and do so that people will see me in an image in a way that I want them to see me. Friends in Christ, I invite you to join me as a company of saved sinners. Like the prostitute that anointed Jesus' feet with tears and perfume. A company of people courageous enough to tear off their masks. Tear off the masks of adequacy and self-righteousness. And get on with a life of gratitude and love. And the law of Christ. Loving people in the same way that God has loved me. The greatest sound in the world for me would be the sound of masks hitting the floor. It's exhausting wearing a mask, hiding, deceiving, fainting. Authentic, grace-filled company of believers is what I desire to be. Authentic. And I want our church, if no other church will, I want our church to be the most honest church on earth. A bunch of struggling people trying to make it by the grace of God, and people crying out every day, Lord Jesus, you are my only hope. You're my only hope. To cast aside the world of fake and phony and silicone and synthetic and hypocriti and hypocrites. People looking for a place of honesty and authenticity. This has to be that place. We have to take off our masks. We have to be authentic. Like King David prayed in Psalm 32. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away. And I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed my sins to you and stopped trying to, here's the word, stop trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. That's authenticity. That's the miracle of grace at work in a human being's life. That is a person of integrity that walks straight and is never double-minded. That is a person who takes off the mask and lives for an audience of one. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I, I confess that so many times in my life I've been a hypocrite. I've been a Pharisee. I want people to like me. I, I want people to think I'm okay. But Lord, among your people, among your people of grace and faith, I should be able to be exactly who I am and still be loved. Lord, that's your church that you desired that changes the world. 
That's individuals that you have made to be authentic and real, just like David. And so, Father, I, I just would pray now in the name of Jesus that you would help us to take off our masks, that you would help our hearts to match our hands, that you would help us to live a life of integrity. And Lord, I just feel right now there needs to be some work done by individuals. And so I just want to give us a moment of silent prayer and give you an opportunity to speak to your heavenly father right now, right now. David said, finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. For that we can only say to you, Lord Jesus, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And we pray all of these things in your name. Amen.